name is Nico. I'm a web developer focused on front end development and WordPress, obviously, in the workshop. I'm self employed, which means I, I do spend an unhealthy amount of time inside a little room I call my office, and I write custom themes, custom plugins, and all kinds of web based software. Well, and today I'm going to talk about progressive web apps. Well, uh, well, a subject that I think will be the next big thing in web development. And I structured my talk around the three most important questions. Obviously the what, the why and the how. And I'll just start with the first question, the what. It's pretty easy, what is progressive web app? Well, the answer is not that easy. Um, I had my first talk about progressive web apps around one year ago. Since then I had some talks about the subject and on each talk I completely changed my definition of progressive web apps. The reason behind that is I'm not very happy with the naming progressive web app. Because that indicates it would be a, a product, like a website or a web app. There you have some differences to tell whether it's a web app or a website, and then or a product like an app, and that's just, I always feel like that should be a product, and in the end it's not. Because a progressive web app is just a website. It's as simple as that. It's based on HTML, it uses CSS, it uses JavaScript, and it runs inside the browser. But there are new features, new browser features, so I call it a website plus. And the fun thing is, that was my very, very first definition of progressive web app. I made a quick turnaround through all kinds of definitions, and now I'm just going back to that very first, very basic definition. So the why. Why, why do we need something new? The web is great, right? We have this, this global network of servers. They're all talking to each other. They're all connected with each other. We have browsers, which means we have standardized scripting languages that run everywhere and in the end someone somewhere on the planet he can publish some piece of content it could be a blog post it could be an image it doesn't matter what and the minute he publishes it i'm able to access it i'm able to read it or we could create web applications very um, powerful web applications that run everywhere that means you can run that, that same web application on an iOS device, on an Android device, on a, um, uh, on, on a desktop PC, on a Mac OS, it just doesn't matter. And that's pretty cool, and that's already happening right now. We do have the capability of those web technologies. But then you have apps, and in that case I'm talking about all, let's say, operating system based software. And that's cool as well because we can access the full potential of our devices, but in the end, we do have to write the exact same application multiple times. We have it maybe for Android, we have it for iOS, we have it for Windows, and we have it for Mac OS. That's just four times exactly the same application. That's, that's insane. Why would anyone do that? Why would anyone create native applications? There's a reason, um, and that's because 87% of the time the user spends on his smartphone, he is inside native apps. That's 87%. That's huge. Because in the end, we all, we, all, we all are web creators in some way. We are designers, we are web developers, we are content creators. And that means we all need to share those remaining 13%. And in the end, that means that the mobile web is there. And that's not just a number I came up or I made up. That's from the Comscore report in 2017. Um, well, and that's pretty bad for all of us. Luckily, there were some very smart people at Google. They were looking at native apps, and they were looking at mobile apps, and they were looking for what are the, the main features why native apps are so much more popular than web apps? There are four words, they're fast, that means 
Once you've downloaded them on your smartphone, they are there. They can boot up immediately. There are no network requests you have to do, or that's in theory. They are integrated. Why is that important? Um, I like to compare it with a living room. You have, you have stuff you use on a regular basis inside your living room. That's limited space, so you have just a, a small amount of stuff you use on a regular basis. Basic. And then you have the window, and you have the door, and you have the whole world in front of you. You could use anything, but that's not just not inside your comfort zone, right? So, everything we have inside our comfort zone, which is integrated in our smartphone, we use on a regular basis, and that's why it's important that those native apps feel like they are, like they are inside our comfort zone. They are reliable. That means that even if we don't have any internet connection or a bad internet connection, there is still something happening if you click on our app icon. So that's not um, what you have on a, on a web application normally. And they are engaging. We can send push notifications with a native app. So we can re-engage our users to, um, to our app, let's say. So they were thinking about those, f those five, four words. And they were thinking about a next generation of web applications. And they called it progressive web apps. The biggest part of my talk, the how, how do we achieve that? Um, I was talking about new browser features, and that's one feature, that's the web app manifest. And it's pretty, well, it's pretty basic, it's just a JSON file that contains some information about our website. We have here, we have a name, a description, some colors, um, we have a display mode, so we can decide whether it should be open in full device, or we could still show the notification bar, or we could use the browser, the browser bar as well. So we can define the display mode, and we can set a whole bunch of icons in different sizes, in different formats, and the, the device can just pick the icon um, it needs. So in the end, what we have here is smashingmagazine.com, which is a progressive web app, and Let's say I've read that, or I've seen that um, article on Facebook or on Twitter. I visit their website, and as soon as it matches the browser progressive web criteria, I will see this little prompt that asks me, hey, that's a progressive web app, do you want to add that to your home screen? I can click it, and then it's right next to all the other native apps. We have this mag smashing magazine app, right next to Chrome, SVP, Twitter, it's, it looks integrated, it looks just like um, a native app. So basically that's all the code it takes to yes. make a website into a progressive web app. Um, as as well, to, if, if as you want to add it to your home screen, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. that, that's it. That's really, that's some lines of, one line of HTML, one, uh, some lines of JSON, and we're done with the add to home screen awesome. thing. The next time I open it, it looks for, as I said, the display mode. So the URL bar is gone, and it just takes the whole, uh, the whole size of our screen, and it really looks like a native app. That's pretty cool. And even if you open our task manager, it's there right next to Slack, which is a native app, and right next to Google Chrome. And that's funny because Google Chrome actually powers the progressive web app, but it's still in the task manager, it, it's right next to the native apps and Google Chrome. That's the at home screen with our manifest. Then we have a new thing called the service worker. And that's the actual magic thing. Because when you have a, a normal website, we have JavaScript files. We have some, maybe you have a theme JavaScript file, we have a uh, plugin and we have core JavaScript files. And the, the latest versions of JavaScript, they're really, really powerful. We can do a, a lot with them, but they have one problem. As soon as we close our website, all those files, all, all those, let's say, apps, they're just gone, they're dead. That we can't do anything uh, after that. So the service worker here is as well is a um, JavaScript file. It's plain JavaScript, 
but it lives inside a different scope. It lives somewhere between the website and our device. And it lives there forever. Even if you close the website, even if you close the browser, it's still there and they can still listen to events. How does it work? Pretty simple as well. Um, we can register it using Navigator Service Circle Register, and then we can just um, put the, the path to our service worker file. We can wrap it inside a feature detection, um, and then we have our service worker. As I said, it's plain JavaScript. It's event-based, so we have the install event. That's when the, the, browse, or the browser first visits the website. It sees, oh, there's a service worker, and it installs it. Then you have to activate the event that's happening um, after the service worker um, was installed. <coughs> And the cool thing is you have a fetch event, so every request goes through the service worker and you can play with that request. One other cool thing is we can use ES6 because um, as soon as I know, all browsers that support service workers also support that new JavaScript uh, version. Um, how can we make our website reliable? We have the same uh, the same example as before. We have a website, it's connected to the internet, so it makes a request, it gets the answer, and it displays the answer. That's simple, and it's, it works. But what if we don't have an internet connection? You will see that network connection error. In Chrome, it's the dinosaur. It's a pretty well, fun thing at the first uh, visit, but it gets really annoying, and we don't have an internet connection for a longer period. Now, with the service worker, we have, first of all, we have the service worker that's between the website and the internet. And we have something new, that's the application storage. And that's very important because even if you don't have any interconnection, we still have like a reliable source where we can put content and we can take content from that source. So we still have something to, to interact with. We have, we have that source, that application storage. In the end, what we can do is, we can, as I said before, every request goes through the server, to the internet, comes back, and then we can decide what, what do we want to do with that request. We can take a copy and put it inside the application storage, and we can pass it to the website, and it will display it on the website. That's cool. And if we don't have an internet connection, we can, we will see here, oh, there's an internet connection, there's a problem, and we can look right here if there is, um, if, if we already have that content stored on that or application storage. And we can, we can just take that cached source from the application storage. So having no internet connections is still pretty bad, but we do have a pretty solid fallback using service workers. Um, when I prepared those slides, I was in, in Italy on a camping site, and, well, it's 2018, I was still in Europe, I did not have no internet, I had Wi-Fi, I had camping site Wi-Fi, <laughs> sometimes better, sometimes nothing, but on regular it was pretty, pretty bad. <clears throat> and. Actually, that's worse than having no internet connection. Because having no connection it is at least honest. Because there is no connection, you don't get any content, you won't see anything, you get, a, you get an error. Having that kind of unstable or just slow internet connection um, leaves, it there, leaves us there staring on a wide screen and it's loading, and loading, and loading, and maybe eventually we will have something we displayed, maybe not. And there's a very cool term by Jake Archibald, and that's Li-Fi, because it's just not honest. Um, how can we get rid of that? Um, that's the same scheme as before, but now we can make our website faster, actually faster using progressive web apps, because that service worker is just JavaScript, and we can play with that. In the end, we, um, 
we can we can take or we can create a different caching strategy. In that case, when the website ma makes a request, we can look at the application storage, and if there is already something in there, we can just take that source instead of the internet, so there's no network request. And that is really fast because it's on our device already, it's already there, um, <clears throat> so there are no network requests. And the cool thing is we can decide for each request, we can decide whether we want to go to the internet and get the, um, the most recent version, or we, could, or we want to have the, that cache flow strategy where we take this um, version from the storage. That means for static files, like CSS, JavaScript, or images, it makes sense to take the copy from the application storage, because that doesn't change on a regular basis, but for dynamic stuff like HTML documents, pages, or uh, JSON, or REST endpoints, it makes sense to first look at the internet if there is a, uh, a newer version. So we can play with those kinds of strategies. The next thing, um, the engaging. Um, being able to send push notification is not very new. We have the web notification API. That's already there for, for years, I think, at least in Chrome. And that allows a website <coughs> to show push notification to the user. The thing is, we have seen before that as soon as I close the website, all our browser script is dead. So it doesn't make sense to show push notifications to, well, to someone who's actually using our site at the moment. So having a service worker, having that infinite or that that um, that reliable thing inside our browser, allows us to send or to trigger a push notification from the network to our service worker to the subscription endpoint, and that service worker worker can then take that push, it can pass it to the device, so it can display the push notification on our device, and that can then re-engage our users with our website. <clears throat> so it's cool because it works even if you're not using the website right now. And having that feature is very cool. Because if you think about, not, on a, not uh, our regular news sites, if you think about Twitter, Facebook, email clients, those are all applications that no, they don't necessarily have to be native apps. But for them, it's very, very important to be able to show push notifications. So that feature is awesome, it's very powerful, but remember, <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. Um, who knows what that is? Yeah. Blocky, blocky. Okay. <laughs> um, that is a browser permission request. And it's not an easy to use extension of your user interface. Because unfortunately, most of you will feel like that, right? Yes. <laughs> the problem here is I've, I've already seen so many, uh, so many websites that are using that uh, in a wrong way. Because I said that's a browser permission request. That's like a camera or a microphone access you would never show a camera access right on the first onload event. That, that's just, nobody would do that, right? Um, but here, with that push notifications permission, I've already, there are so many pages that just throw it on the onload event, and they think, well, if you we, if we show it on the first time, maybe someone, someone will click yes, but that won't happen, because if you think about that, you read an article on, or you, you see an article on Twitter or Facebook, visit a website, that's the very first time you're visiting that website, you have no idea how often they will send push notifications, about what subjects they will send push notifications, and nobody would allow that. But still, at the moment that's a very bad, um, or it's, let's say that's a, um, how do you call it, an anti-pattern in user experience that's happening a lot right now. So, we have uh, our progressive web app, because it's fast, because we have our cache for strategies for static files, it's integrated with our app to home screen um, <clears throat> functionality, it's reliable because we have our application storage, 
and it's engaging because you can use push notifications. Awesome. And there are a lot of very good examples like Pinterest or as well Twitter Line. They're very cool uh, progressive web applications. But the thing I always ask myself, is that possible to use <coughs> those features for any multi-page application or for any uh, WordPress application? And that's why I created our own website, Added Progressive Web App, so you can add it to your home screen, it works offline, and uh, you can uh, receive push notifications. But as you can see here, it's a very decent option in footer. So if you want to, you can, you can click on it, and then it will ask you uh, whether if you want to allow uh, push notifications or not. And it won't ask you just upfront. What kind of push notifications do you have? Or would you put there? There, um, <coughs> In that case, you, you would receive push notifications for our, our blog. We have blog posts maybe every six months, <laughs> not that often, or new projects. But and uh, what about other websites? What kind of push notifications can we receive if we say if we say accept instead of decline? All kinds of push notifications. You're completely free. If you you as a developer, you can send all kinds of push notifications. You could send every five minutes a push notification that says, Hi, I'm there. We could do that. <laughs> but so it can be pretty annoying. Yeah. yeah okay. So the developer, and that's why it's a powerful feature, because if you allow that, yeah, um, you allow the website to spam you with push notifications. So that's why it's very powerful, and you should be aware when and when, why, and how to ask. Mm -hmm. Slack users also. Slack like, uses it. Okay. In the browser. So that makes sense as well because if you have a noti notification, you can uh, have a push notification. And after that, I created a plugin called Progressive WordPress, and there you can add all those features as an add on enhancement to any existing WordPress website. A website. And I think that's pretty cool, and when I Created that plugin, it was, or when I published it, it was the first progressive web app plugin, first fully featured progressive web app plugin. And back then, that was no problem. But now we, we see a, a, a growing number of plugins that use progressive web features, of themes that use progressive web app features. Maybe the manifest is something that should be uh, managed by the theme. And as soon as you have multiple modules, like themes and plugins that all use those, those features, we very quickly will have conflicts. Let's take the manifest file. There can only be one manifest file per website. If you have a theme and a plugin and they both try to register your manifest file, that will at least one will fail. Also the service worker. If you have multiple service worker, multiple fetch event listeners, um, you will quickly have some, com some conflict between them. Luckily, there already is a solution that's a feature plugin by XWP uh, in collaboration with Google. And the idea here is to, to bring standardized ways, standardized APIs, um, so we as developers can use those APIs instead of registering our own files. Let's take the manifest file. My plugin registers a new manifest file, and if you have that plugin in core, I can just hook into that API and add my values to the already existing manifest file. That's very important. Um, I was able to contribute to the discussion from the very beginning on, and I already, uh, I also did some commits to the code. And the cool thing, as far as I know, WordPress is the only CMS at the moment that is working on a uh, progressive web app solution for the core. And that's a very important thing for the future, and I think every CMS, especially every module-based CMS, needs to have some kind of progressive web app implementation as well as API. <laughs> so, um, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think we still have Time for some questions. About seven minutes. About seven minutes? Not long. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what would be, uh, or is there a solution for the 
pop up that, hey, I want to send you push notifications. Obviously, the user doesn't know what kind. Can, there, can the developer put there more information, like these are the push notifications that I'm going to send you if you accept, mm -hmm. or that can be put on a separate page then I guess on the website that if you enable that this is what we're going to send you, or what would be a, a solution for this? Because I think lots of users <laughs> simply decline yeah. because they don't know what they're going to yeah. as, as far as I know, there's no way to add more information to that prompt. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, how do you handle that prompt? Mm -hmm. As I said, it's a browser permission request, and if, if you want to, you should do those steps before you show the request. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to our own website, you will click on the push notification, then there's a pop-up mm -hmm. explaining you, hey, uh, we send push notifications, um, I don't know. If when we do a blog post. Yeah, when we do a blog post, some, something like that, and then you can click activate, and that's when the, the prompt is triggered. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it's clear for the user, oh, okay, it's about that, it's that page, um, well, I can, I can allow it. Mm -hmm. But if it's right on the onload event, nobody can. Yeah. Uh, so basically, the developers at the moment, most of the developers are using this uh, in not the right way. <coughs> wrong. Yeah. It's like um, the Google map or the geo geolocation request. That's something, if you are on the web, uh, on the home page, and you have no map or, no, or anything, and you show that prompt, the user will, will think, well, well, why do they need that? I just decline it. And the same, the same thing here, it has to be clear why they give that access before you show the, the prompt. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, that's our here. So, uh, two comments. First one is this year at Work in Europe, uh, it was the first year when they created a aggressive web app where you could uh, scale, check all the talks and you could choose some of the talks and build your own agenda. That was very useful because there are three tracks plus two workshop tracks in parallel and you just don't know I need to go now here and there and then you just see your own agenda like compiled. All those perfect use case. Perfect use case. Because <laughs> so you have the application storage and you could, or you have multiple stuff on your device already, and you can just create, uh, let's say, device based information. Yeah, yeah. it worked awesome, wonderfully. Okay. And the second uh, comment about um, how to make uh, that pop up appear more user friendly, and I just think I draw some inspiration from. Do you remember all those websites who are forcing you to install an .exe file and, and to, to, to infect your computer? Like they are starting to down, they are downloading your, they, they start to download your .exe file and they are displaying a page with HTMLs showing you an arrow. Please click on this file here, then it will, you will have a pop-up where you need to confirm this. Well, that's a bad purpose, of course, but we can, I think we can draw on that inspiration <laughs> and build an HTML page which will actually show an arrow inside of the HTML saying, hey, if you press on this button, a pop-up will appear there, please click on the... And that then you provide a screenshot and... Yeah. But that makes sense um, if you denied the request once, you want that, that prompt will only show up once, and if you blocked it, it won't show up again. And then you need to find another way that the user, oh, okay, I blocked it before because they had a bad usage before, but now I need, we need to, let's say, um, find a way that the user actually allows it, and then you have that arrow that shows you, hey, here in the browser settings, you need to allow, you, you need to allow it. But that makes sense if that prompt is blocked by. Maybe we can check from the code that it was blocked and change the graphics. It was blocked for the first yeah. time. Yeah. If it's the first time, display one graphics mm -hmm. yeah. saying, hey, prepare, the pop up will appear here in yeah. the screenshot. Mm -hmm. Next click here. This is how these scammy websites work. I think we can learn from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, which plugin will you use? Your own plugin or the, the, <laughs> the one that's coming in WordPress core? Um, the thing is, it's not yet clear what the scope will be of the plugin in the core. Yeah. My personal opinion is that core plugin should be very basic. So there should be maybe those core APIs are very important and maybe some fallback solutions as well. But at the moment it's not clear 
how far that plugin will go or how, how far that those core integrations will, will go. Will you be able to send push notifications by default in the WordPress core? I don't think so. It, I hope, well, I don't hope so. Um, so it's still, the core should provide the APIs and the plugin should do like stuff on top of that. Yeah. And my plugin does a lot of things on top of that. You can yeah. choose caching strategies for each um, file type. You can uh, send push notifications and you can, yeah. So if we started using your plugin, you would in the future then also update to support those new core features? It is already compatible with the XWP plugin. Oh, so you so can install already, them together? Yeah. Okay. I think that works at the moment. I'm not sure. I think they will update the version in the future pretty <coughs> some days. Um, but I already implemented those, or I'm already working with those APIs if they are available. Okay. So. One minute left. Yeah. So if I would understand on the mobile on mobile devices, it's possible to receive a notification when the application is closed, right? We're all um, so is it working with uh, iOS? Uh, because when I, I create a native application, I need to create a uh, certificate on the developer, um, on the developer, then upload it to Firebase or my own server, something like that. Uh, Not yet. Not yet. Because the web push as notification, web notification API is not um, available on iOS. Um, I'm, I have no idea if and how and what, when that would be available. That's the, big, that's the biggest problem at the moment. But the other features, they work on iOS. So it's just pushing. You know, one of the last questions, yeah. yeah. is there a limit to how much and what kind of data can be saved on that? Mm. Like Google Maps? Stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm really not sure about that. Um, there is a limit. I've read something about each application can only use half of the available space on your device, and there you also have limitations. And I'm not sure if there's a standard defined yet, and it really depends on the device. About, uh, depends on how much space do you have on your device. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you.